Welcome to the Next Level Human Podcast. As a human, you have a job to do. In fact, you have four jobs. To earn and manage money, to attain and maintain health and fitness, to build and sustain personal relationships, to find meaning and make a difference. None of these jobs are taught in school, and that is what this podcast is designed to do, to educate us all on living our most fulfilled lives through the mastery of these four jobs. I'm your host, Dr. Jade Tita, and I believe we are here living this life for three reasons and three reasons only, to learn, to teach, and to love. Love. In this podcast, I will be learning, teaching, and loving right along with you. I'm grateful to have your company. Here's to our next level. Level. All right, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to today's show. I actually have a special guest on the show today. This is a podcast I've been wanting to do for a while uh, this is my good friend, Brendan Vermeyer. And um, Brendan and I have been trying to get uh, together to do a podcast. It's probably been, I don't know, Brendan, it's probably been about a year we've been talking back and forth where I've been like, yo, I want to get you on my show. And you're like, cool, whenever you're ready. And uh, we finally got to do this. And I'm very excited about it. And just so all of you know, um, Brendan is a really, really amazing educator in the space of functional uh, medicine. A lot of us in this space uh, are really um, sort of paying attention to his content, uh, learning from him constantly. He's definitely someone who you're going to want to pay attention to if you don't know him already. And him and I are essentially just going to have a talk that uh, we're going to let this sort of go uh, where it goes. But one of the things I was telling Brendan as we got on is I am fascinated by the way he teaches and discusses and educates on the whole interface of the nervous system and metabolism. Now, we know we can't really separate those two. The nervous system is the metabolism. But uh, this idea of neuroinflammation and how inflammatory insults in the body uh, are changing and adjusting the nervous system in ways that may not be uh, very healthy for us and have downstream effects. We, as we know, this is not one system. It's all a system, right? It's all a web. So it's the neuroendocrine, immune, blah, blah, blah system. It's all connected. And so what I like about what Brendan does is he really helps us sort of lock into the idea that the nervous system is one of these areas that's constantly being um, insulted uh, is a word, uh, influenced is another word by our environment. And so we are going to have a discussion about this on the mechanisms behind this and what are some of the things that we can do. So, Brendan, what I I want you to do to start, if you would, is just give us a sort of a background into you, your work, how you got into this work. And then let's you and I get into this uh, sort of topic. And, and those of you listening, just understand, yes, this is going to be probably a very scientific uh, discussion. But one of the things that's wonderful about Brendan is he does bring this down to earth. And so we'll take it slow and, and uh, make sure that you get it. But Brendan, give us an idea of how you got into this stuff in the first place, your interest, you know, functional medicine, essentially your story, bro. Yeah, absolutely, man. You know, Jade, it's such a pleasure as always, because it's cool when I look back over the course of my, I'm going on, you know, 13, 14 years now with this whole career. I started young and the path I've been on for so many years where I look back across the past decade plus, and there's only a small handful of people that I would say like, yes, that figure, that figure, that figure had a big influential role on my career path. And you're, you're on that very short list. You know, you, John Berardi, Brian Walsh, Karan Krishnan, those are kind of the top four that, that come to mind of people that inspired a lot of my work, inspired my career path. Cause you know, you start as a trainer, you were going through naturopathic medical school, doing the fitness thing. So I saw what you were doing with metabolic effect, like many years ago. And I was just a young lad, like working through my own shit and all of that. And going through your program back in the day is really, in my eyes, what helped me start transitioning from your more kind of prototypical fitness, nutrition, PhD, and bro science into then getting exposed to all these naturopathic medicine concepts and then kind of steering me into the functional medicine world. So getting to be here now, it's this amazing full circle. And yeah, it's been 
maybe like two years since I had you on my podcast. And, and then this has been a long time coming. So it's uh, really cool to be here. And I appreciate you having me. Yeah, man, listen, uh, I didn't know that necessarily, <laughs> but I, I, I love that and appreciate that. And it's really cool, right? Uh, because now I get to learn uh, from you. And I just think that's the way it works, right? You know, so whereas you may have been learning from me in the past, now I'm soaking up everything you got. So yeah, I really love when that kind of thing happens. Oh, it's 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 beautiful. I mean, there's there's nothing better than that. Doing those full, full circles in life, and even just yesterday, I was recording uh, a lesson for my FMHP program, and the the two hours I was recording was just all about GLP one and the role of GLP one mechanisms for you know neurodegeneration, metabolic syndrome, everything in between. It was actually like I first learned about GLP one in your program like many yeah. years ago. I was like, wow, this really matters, and you know, kind of digging into it from there. So, I mean, you know, even just telling the story of you and I, I kind of told a little bit about my history where, you know, I've told my story so many times and there's like the painful, grueling, like long detailed version of it versus kind of the consolidated where it's like, you know, I was a high school athlete, you know, wrestling at that point in time, like my dream was to either be like a UFC fighter or a Navy SEAL. Um, but it was, I was 17, senior year of high school and, you know, doing a physical for sports, seasonal affective disorder kind of stuff, which, you know, no official evaluation of any kind. It was just like, Hey, I, I get depressed during winter and whatever. So I was put on an SSRI, Zoloft, sertraline, you know, and at the age of 17, it's like, I'm just trying to figure out life. So then after high school, as soon as I turned 18, I signed a six year Navy SEAL contract and was, you know, following that path, which the long story short on that was I was medically discharged about halfway through basic training because they found it a inguinal hernia that I didn't know about. They deemed it pre-existing and, you know, it's not their problem. It's not their liability. If it was pre-existing, if you suffer an injury in training, that's a different story. So my Navy SEAL dreams kind of got taken away from me. I was already kind of probably hindsight, you know, high functioning, depressed young man for whatever reasons. And obviously we'll explore some of those different root cause factors as we go. But then having my sense of purpose, which as you and I are huge on, with both of our platforms preach that constantly of that sense of purpose as, as a buffer, you know, against depression and mental illness and kind of existential crisis. So I was at a very low place in my life by that point. And it was ironic how becoming a fitness and nutrition professional, you know, I got NASM CPT, PN1, because I didn't want to go to academia. The academia route didn't really interest me. You know, I was looking into dietet dietetics or naturopathic medicine and still didn't quite feel like the right path for me. And of course, looking up to people like you and, and others within the space that had gone that route. And they all told me the same thing of like, you're not going to learn what you want to learn, you know, going to registered dietitian school or even naturopathic to some degree. So I was like, well, shoot, I got to find my own way. So that's actually when I found your program that helped me kind of segue outside of the academia model. But during those years of my life, and I'm kind of consolidating many years, actually, in my early 20s, you know, I found myself in a pretty codependent, narcissistic empath, as cliche as those words are these days. But it was the prototypical example of that older woman and the whole thing. That was a really unhealthy situation. I didn't come into it from a good place. She had lots of um, root cause factors that are relevant for this conversation of unresolved childhood trauma and, you know, multiple concussions from getting dropped on her head as a cheerleader and a stunter, right? Uh, plus, you know, water damage to the home, mold, you know, whatever. So it's like this perfect storm. And through that journey, I actually ended up, uh, you know, attempting suicide and swallowing an entire bottle of my, at the time, antidepressant, well, future and a dopamine agonist. You know, so I spent three nights in a coma in the ICU, spent another, you know, four nights getting everything pumped and flushed. And, you know, I later found some blood work that I dug up and my liver enzymes were in the thousands, right? Because I had poison my liver through that. Um, so that was this whole journey. And that essentially, I got that firsthand experience of what is the conventional approach to mental illness, you know, whether it was when I was 17, getting put on an SSRI with no blood work, no psychiatric or psychological evaluation or referral of any kind, just primary care, Hey, high school kid, here's, you know, Zoloft that now has these, you know, stern black box warnings and can increase suicidal ideation and the mechanisms, questionable efficacy, only about 30%, right? So all this stuff. 
But that was when I was 17 and then 21, finally getting a referral. But then by that point, you know, it's like I'm suicidal and go for it. And then going through what happens when you do something like that. And then you're hospitalized and you're put in psychiatric ward. And um, the way that they change your medications while you're in the ward without telling you, and you're just kind of like a guinea pig that they're trying to stabilize pharmaceutically, can't step outside, no contact with the outside world, no nutritious whole foods at all. It's just all processed cafeteria food. You know, so I saw just how dysfunctional the conventional psychiatric model was. And then trying to go back to my fitness, nutrition, health coaching career, that was very like progressive and science-based and, well, let's use lab testing and VO2 as part of the, you know, metabolic testing as part of the, the health coaching transformative journey. So then it just became this very organic evolution from there as I was trying to navigate my way out of, you know, personal hell and that relationship that ended up with, you know, she ended up killing herself in 2020, tragically. I don't say that lightly by any means. Mm. You know, um, my attempt, obviously, getting off all the medications on my own naturally. So it's like having to navigate that all the personal struggles, the relational struggles, the professional struggle with not fitting into this billion dollar corporate box that I was trying to be, you know, put in with that specific company you know, going through your program, going through training in functional medicine and stuff. So to be here today is so trippy because it's like, how did I get here? But it's like, well, I know exactly how I got here because I remember every single step of the journey. But to see like what I've done with that and taking the pain, turning it into purpose, figuring out how, you know, the business side of it, the clinical side of it, the research side of it, the message side of it. So it's been a trippy journey, but it just um, brings me enormous fulfillment. And I always say my work is my medicine. And I mean it. And I don't even like thinking of it as my work. It's my mission. You know, it's my purpose. It's what I identify with. So, yeah, and it continues to be trippy. The existential landscape continues to evolve and shift. And so I find a lot of my own healing continues the medicine, the daily dose as I pursue my path and my knowledge. And I'm just sharing bits and pieces I've learned along the way and trying to advance the clinical research, train practitioners while educating the public. And, you know, I've had to learn how to get really fluid with my languaging and, and the way people receive information. So it's, it's wild. And I continue to learn every day and the path continues to humble me and delight me and enchant me every single day. So it's a pleasure to get to have op opportunities, to have these kinds of conversations with people that get it like yourself and somebody I've looked up to for so many years. Yeah, Brandon. I mean, honestly, man, um, that gives me goosebumps hearing that hearing that story. And if uh, I, I want to just if you'll just allow me to divert before we get into some yeah. of this really quickly, because I think what you just brought us through is so critically important, especially for a podcast called The Next Level Human. So one of the things I want to share with you listeners, if it wasn't apparent to you already, as you're listening to Brendan talk, is one of the things I think. Uh, we need to sort of be aware of that. I, uh, I just think is a beautiful aspect of life is that if you listen to Brandon's story, right, there's trauma after trauma, after trial, after trial, after tribulation, after more trauma, right? So this is somebody who is struggling mightily. And by the way, we all do in our own way. But the difference is that somehow these things became breadcrumbs for Brendan like breadcrumbs and directions to his mission and his purpose, which to me is uh, the story, the hero's journey wrapped up in a nutshell is what you essentially just told us. And it's also an escape from a pretty, uh, as you and I know, uh, you know better than me because I didn't experience it, but I certainly looked at it from the outside looking in, a system that uh, does not serve uh, their patients. Now, not on purpose, just out of uh, sheer uh, misunderstanding, misapprehension, ignorance, call it like, you know, we just don't know and didn't know enough. Uh, a lot of people are listening to this show would not be surprised by the idea that people like you and I would say the vast majority of healthcare professionals, I will include myself in that too, don't have all of the information. We know very little uh, of what we really could know. But here's a person who's going through this and essentially saying, I'm going to take this hurt and turn it into a way to help. I'm going to take this suffering and turn it into a source of meaning. I'm going to take this pain and make it my path to purpose. 
uh, this is essentially what you did. And it's absolutely amazing to me, too, as I'm getting goosebumps. And now all of a sudden you're in a position after going through all of this. And now you're teaching and training uh, both the lay public and professionals. And you're also somebody who came at this from a very different path. Like you had to trust the fact that, you know what, I can learn this stuff on my own. I can master this stuff on my own. I don't need to go the traditional route and uh, look at where you are now. And I think it's a lesson uh, before we really get into uh, some of the science stuff that's going to be useful for, for people with mental health. The first lesson of this is this idea of we can, in a sense, uh, turn our traumas into something that is extremely beneficial for the world. And perhaps in doing so, we actually began the process of healing ourselves. And so I guess the first way to then start, because it segues right into your story, is let's talk a little bit about adverse childhood events and these traumas that we go through as uh, individuals and how they impact um, the nervous system and how they can set us up for uh, potential health and or dysfunction and or disease. I just want to know, do you have anything to say on this? And like, what is your sort of take on it? And I just want to hear how you see this because traumas can, in a very real sense, set our nervous system up to behave in particular ways. And I think this is something that the listener would be extremely interested in. And you are someone who obviously had these traumas and someone who also uh, obviously has overcome them in a very healthy way. So give us some understanding or your take on how this works with traumas and childhood adverse events. Yeah, it's, it's a huge subject. I mean, we could spend hours just on that one. And, you know, I have so many thoughts, opinions, anecdotal observations, research findings, you know, pretty strong body evidence kind of stand on and experience to, to speak from. Uh, and I think you're very perceptive. And, and I look at what you do in your platform and what I do in my platform, and, and there's more overlap than not, where sure, we have our unique branding and our, our unique message. But, you know, I know we're right in sync on this, and especially with the subject of trauma and adverse childhood experiences that subject has never been more trendy. And, and I do want to give credit where credit's due, where Nicole LaPere is a good friend of mine, former client. And, you know, I, I give a lot of credit to her for what she's done at a pretty global mass level uh, with her holistic psychologist platform. And then so many others kind of following suit. And now it's this whole, you could really say like trauma is now an industry, a holistic, social sociological industry in itself that has nothing to do with really the healthcare system this is all outside of the system it's it's almost like pop culture sociology and so with that you know i think there's a lot of amazing content and work being done with the subject of trauma but there's also a lot of sensationalism and there's a lot of ambiguity subjectivity nuance so something you know there's the hard clinical research truth which i'll drop a little bit of but before even getting into that, I always like to delineate between like conditioning and trauma, right? Because I think my experience in 13 years of serving clients and everything I've done, I would say one of the greatest root causes of all is victim mentality. You know, it, it's rampant in our population. It's rampant in our society and the social fabric. And there's no healing that can really take place, you know, within a self-victimization construct. And so with this kind of idea of trauma, first off, autism was the first to be recognized as a spectrum disorder, but I argue and postulate every mental health disorder. And in fact, literally pretty much everything in existence exists on a spectrum, even light and electromagnetic radiation, it's a spectrum. So if we create kind of this trauma spectrum of like more severe trauma, and I think of like a soldier stepping on a landmine in a foreign country, like that's extremely traumatic. Versus like, oh, I heard my parents fighting in the kitchen once upon a time and I didn't like it, right? We have to be sensitive and respectful. Like some people have experienced very severe trauma and we need to be sensitive to that. And I think it's almost kind of insensitive when you get people that their trauma is questionable, right? I mean, it's subjective, it's perception, sure. To each their own, everybody can have their own experience and is entitled to their perception of their reality, sure. But is it serving you? Right. Is the narrative that you're creating based on your experience, is it really serving your eudaimonic self-actualization path? 
So with conditioning and trauma, we have to recognize like life, life is hard in general. There's always going to be hard. And these days, the modern lifestyle is like way more cush, convenient, done for you than ever before. We're not fighting off saber tooth tigers or dealing with famine or whatever, at least not most of us that are probably listening to this podcast, right? So delineating of like, okay, look, no athlete loves going through like a really br brutally difficult conditioning workout. But what's the point of working out or, or that conditioning? It's to make you more resilient, right? The, the tree doesn't grow big and strong without a, a lot of wind trying to push it over. You know, that's what builds that resilience. It's that rubber band effect. You stretch it and it snaps back. It grows bigger, stronger than before. So we need to, to some degree, embrace adversity, trauma, adverse childhood events, whatever it is. Embrace it. What can we learn from it? Right. How can we let it be a character building exercise and help us improve our spiritual, psychological resilience to life? Because there's always going to be that conditioning factor, but you can't heal from something that you ingrain as part of your identity. Right. So whether it's like I identify as being traumatized, I identify as having nervous system dysregulation, which what happened to HP axis dysfunction or adrenal fatigue, it keeps changing. I don't know because it's trendy. It's catchy. So I just think through some of that trendiness and sensationalism, there's some truths that kind of get distorted. And, and what we don't want to do as educators or researchers or whatever it is that we are, we don't want to enable self-limiting, self-destructive behaviors. So there's kind of that rhetoric. But then uh, all the while, my thing with my whole area of research and focus being neuroinflammation, neuroplasticity and, and microglial activation, which we might get into. I'm always looking at root causes that effectively, effectively alter our neurology, you know, psychoneuroendocrine immunology, genomics, whatever. Like I'm looking at that interface of what input signals, whether it's trauma or head concussion or mold, doesn't really matter what input signals alter, you know, that, that biology essentially. So when you actually like cut through all the trendy stuff on the social media algorithm, and skip to like look at the clinical research that's coming out on PTSD. For example, one of the big focal points with the neuroinflammatory aspects, like I think it would be sensationalized to say neuroinflammation causes PTSD. But what we can definitively say is neuroinflammation and compromised neuroplasticity and neurotransmitter dysregulation or neurotrophin dysregulation is implicated in PTSD. And what they're currently working on from a you know, how do we pharmacologically treat PTSD clinically? Okay, well, the focus on that, obviously, historically, it's more SSRIs and neuropsychiatric drugs that modulate neurotransmitter signaling. But now the new generation, it's all about inhibiting neuroinflammation and promoting neuroplasticity, which can be done in a lot of ways. You know, psychedelics, obviously, huge area of focus for PTSD, MDMA, psilocybin, LSD, all of it, because that's kind of the main property of psychedelics is they reduce neuroinflammation, promote neuroplasticity. But one of the main models that they're using for PTSD clinical research, you know, they'll take rats and traumatize the rats, whether it's, you know, force swim tests, you know, make the rats feel like they're drowning to traumatize them and induce that biological trauma response at a cellular tissue level, uh, tail suspension, dangle the little rats by their tails until they're traumatized to ele electrocute their little mouse feet until they're traumatized, but they do these trauma models to then activate the immune system of the brain regulated by the microglial cells to induce this neuroinflammatory phenotype. And then that causes the neurotransmitter dysregulation and the anxiety-like behavior, the depressive-like behavior, the ap apathy, the anhedonia, that, that behavior, those symptoms that we associate as they're traumatized. So they traumatize the rats, they do that. And then they'll give them different drugs or supplements or whatever to see, can we treat that, you know, with a pill or uh, some sort of therapeutic. So like minocycline as an antibiotic is one of the main ones that they look at. So that's actually something that they're looking at is repurposing this antibiotic, tetracycline antibiotic that is minocycline, which is known to cross the blood brain barrier and have an inhibitory effect on those microglial cells. And, and they see that when they do that. Minocycline is the main one, but there's others, vitamin D or psychedelics or whatever. But they see that when they modulate the microglial cells and reduce the neuroinflammation, boost the neuroplasticity, 
the trauma symptoms, anxiety, depression, whatever, it goes away. The behavior changes when you fix the physiology, the neurology at a cellular level. So my thing to sum all that up is like, I feel like the internet is very focused on the psychology, you know, the belief systems and looking at trauma through that lens and nervous system dysregulation, which yes, the HP axis is dysregulated in trauma and PTSD. But I feel like we're missing the mark because the clinical research, the hard data and what big pharma is trying to figure out how to monetize for their deep pockets is, you know, what pill, what therapeutic can we give to treat it? And the focus is, is what I said of any kind of therapeutic approach that reduces the neuroinflammatory board burden and increases the neuroplastic remodeling and healing of the brain. So I think there's this whole conversation we're not having with trauma while everybody's getting really excitable about some of the soothing psychological narratives that are popular. It's time to talk about one of our sponsors of today's episode, AG1 by Athletic Greens. Now, many of you have heard me say this before, but I am not a fan of vegetables, which I know is funny given I've been in the health and fitness industry for so long. I blame my mother and father for this when I was a kid. What they would do is essentially take the broccoli, the Brussels sprouts, the spinach, the collard greens, and just steam them. No salt, no fat, no taste whatsoever, just these bitter greens. And so I developed a distaste for a lot of different vegetables, which has stayed with me into adulthood. One of the things I've done to mitigate that is use a greens powder pretty much ever since greens powders have come out on the market. And I've tried every single one. They started out tasting like swamp water. I found a few that I really like the taste. But recently, one that I have been taking for a very long time, as you all know, I wear a continuous glucose monitor. I found that it was actually spiking my blood sugar because probably the tapioca starch in it, which some people don't respond to tapioca starch with elevated blood sugars. I was. And so it sent me on a mission to find another one. And one of my friends turned me on to AG1 by Athletic Greens. And I've heard about Athletic Greens and AG1 for quite some time. I just never tried it. And now that I have tried it, I have become a huge fan, so much so that I partnered with Athletic Greens and AG1 to sponsor this podcast. Now, let me tell you what happened here? After I saw that my blood sugars were spiking, my friend gave me a couple samples of AG1. I began using those and testing the blood sugar and found there was no spike. The other thing I found is that AG1 is interested in its taste profile. It's very neutral. The one I was taking before was a little sweet. I really loved it. But this one is very neutral, which actually suits me because what I found is I can actually not only take this first thing in the morning in water, and have it taste very neutral, almost like there's nothing there, I can also add it into my protein shakes, which means now I'm getting double the greens that I was getting previously, because I add this right into my protein shakes, and it does not change the flavor of the shake at all. The other thing I realized once I started looking at the label is that this product is not simply a greens product. It also is a multivitamin, multimineral. It also has fiber, which acts as a prebiotic. It has probiotics in it, and it has functional mushrooms, which act as adaptogens in it. That's four different products essentially in one. And I've been taking mushrooms for some time. I stopped taking them now because now I have this in my greens. I have also taken my multivitamin and make this my multivitamin. So I'm actually saving money, and this is going to save you money as well. The product AG1 is also NSF certified. And you may say, Jade, what does that mean? The National Sanitation Foundation is a foundation that essentially does testing on products to make sure there are no harmful substances, no persistent organic pollutants, no heavy metals. Now, this costs money to do. AG1 and Athletic Greens has spent the money on this. They spend money on making sure that the product that you are getting is good quality without contamination in it. You might say, well, Jade, isn't this true of all products? And actually, no, it is not. If you ever follow some of the news in this area through con uh, consumer labs and other things that do uh, you know, testing on these products, you'll see that many of them 
will have trace levels of things like mercury and cadmium and lead and things like that in them because they're not doing this testing. So this is an extra piece of insurance for us. The other thing I love about this product that I learned as I was doing my research on it is that this is the 52nd tweak or adjustment they have made to this product in their existence. AG1 has been tweaked 52 times. Now you might say, well, Jade, why would they be doing that? And the reason why is because they continue to improve. We know that science is evolving. We know that it's not just about more nutrients. It's about balanced nutrients. It's about the Goldilocks effect of this. And they are constantly learning, as we all are, and then constantly adjusting their product to taste better, to be more efficient and effective in delivering the nutrients. It acts as an antioxidant. It acts as a multivitamin. It's a prebiotic, a probiotic, and an adaptogen all in one. They have mastered this over several iterations of this particular product. And so I am a huge fan right now of AG1 and Athletic Greens. And I'm hoping that you will check this out. It's time for all of us to reclaim our health and arm our immune system with convenient daily nutrition. And AG1 does that with just one scoop in a cup of water every single day. That is all you need. There is now no longer a need for a million different pills and supplements to look after your health. All you need is this particular one. It really clears the stage to simplify your supplement regime. To make it easy for you, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash next level. That's athleticgreens.com slash next level to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Check out AG1. I love it. I know you're going to love it. And I'm so happy that they are on board to sponsor the podcast as well. Thanks so much. Check out AG1, athleticgreens.com slash next level. And let's get back to the show. Yeah, I love that. I'm, I'm going to come in with a couple things just to kind of um, see where we want to go with this. One of the things that um, a lot of people you'll hear say is they'll say, you know, you can't take trauma and um, compare it. Right. But I'm a little bit more uh, sort of on your side of things. I, I agree, you know, that if you're someone who's never experienced rape, but you've experienced, you know, bullying, then bullying is perhaps the greatest trauma you're going to have. And that bullying could potentially trigger some of uh, the things that essentially you're talking about. Now, on the other side of that, you can have somebody who's been raped or uh, been in war zones and they don't uh, have sort of these uh, they don't identify so much with the trauma, right? They have, they're so resilient that even these horrible traumas uh, don't result in the dysfunction that we might see from some people who have, you know, um, who some people might compare and say, well, that's not nearly the same trauma, which speaks to the fact that maybe, yes, we can't compare traumas. Maybe there's something else going on within the individual that makes traumas traumatic and even makes a trauma that might seem um, minuscule and, uh, you know, a low tier trauma to society be a very high tier trauma to that particular individual. And so because we have this continuum or gray zone of traumas, like all these gradations of traumas, and because we have the individuals who also seem to have, uh, you know, uh, different abilities to handle trauma, some people even being through the most culturally, you know, scary traumas we can think of and being resilient to them tells us right away there's something else going on, which speaks to sort of what you're saying uh, here, I think. And then the idea becomes, OK, so, yes, there's different ways that we're beginning to study this and uh, different, um, you know, uh, modalities, uh, drugs and these kinds of things that seem to be able to help. But what I'm most interested in is I'm most interested in, OK, so. How do we, is there a way simply through behavior, through thinking, through, uh, you know, um, acting uh, and exposing ourselves to uh, traumatic events or scary situations? Is there a way to uh, build up this resilience just through uh, this idea of thinking, feeling, acting, 
in a particular way. Like you alluded to, Brandon, like, you know, if you and I want to uh, get stronger in the gym, we're both guys who spend a lot of time in the gym. We're going to challenge ourselves with uncomfortable uh, you know, sort of weights and things like that. I know I always look at Brandon doing these crazy deadlifts, <laughs> right? But, you know, if he's going to, for you listeners, if he's going to max out on a deadlift, the heaviest weight he's ever used on a deadlift, it's going to be a little scary uh, uh, for Brandon. But he's also built up the resilience along the way, doing these personal records and attacking his heaviest lift over and over again that allows it to be scary, but still uh, be approachable. And so I am most interested in, a couple things to see if you have anything to say about this. And I think it will segue into other insults. Right now we're talking about the insult of trauma and the idea of one person's trauma is, you know, sort of another person's, you know, just walk in the park. And one person's ability to be resilient is another person's, you know, uh, situation of just falling apart at the slightest insult. And so from my perspective, in the research you've done and looked at, um, have you seen there be any uh, good evidence base for people being able to change this just through behaviors, just through thinking, feeling and acting in particular ways that expose them to difficult stuff? Or is it going to be a combination of things where, yes, you have to do that, but also then we can use things like psychedelics or nutraceuticals or even drugs uh, to address some of this dysfunction? Because it almost sounds like what you're saying, and I don't know if I got this right or not, that it's perhaps a chicken or an egg situation. So, okay, so you had trauma. Were you predisposed to that trauma ahead of time, which made you less resilient? And then once you have that trauma, is that sort of like a vicious cycle that makes you more likely to be traumatized by other events? And can we, if that's the case, and it is sort of this chicken and egg cycle, can we somehow reverse that cycle through um, psychological therapeutics, nutraceuticals, and things like that? And I'm just wondering if you have anything to say on that or if it makes your brain go in any sort of direction. Because I do think this is a very important um, topic and one that's very important for the times. Oh, absolutely. I think it's absolutely critical. And that was a perfect kind of rhetoric postulate there because what's interesting and what, what makes what I try to do really difficult is trying to bridge that gap between kind of the psychological and physiological and, and even esoteric quantum, spiritual, whatever. And so like my little yin yang uh, logo thing that's on all my posts, like that's what that's supposed to really symbolize is like, well, I've always looked at mental health and what fascinates me so much about mental health as a construct is it's always that mixture of, of psychology and physiology. You can't ever fully separate them. Now, you know, when you're trying to like, let's say, work with a client or patient, help them, you know, reclaim their mental health, you have to delineate between the two. You have to take the time to map out. Well, these are the psychological healing opportunities that we see on the table. Here's the physiological. And for me, like when I was really struggling with my mental health, I've always found the more mechanistic science to be soothing. You know, when I have like a tangible, objective, measurable, quantifiable uh, explanation for the suffering, you know, it makes me feel like, okay, it's, it's not just me. It's not just in my head. I don't have like a shitty attitude or outlook on life like there's more to it than that and on the one hand our whole population has been so conditioned for you know the pill for the ill mentality and that's the problem with functional medicine these days is you know selling behavior modification let alone coaching it is extremely difficult whereas you know sell a test or two and sell fancy well concocted supplement protocol is very very easy and, and that's the issue that we all see in functional medicine is too many clients and patients they just, well, what's the, the, the lab that tells me the root cause? And then I throw some supplements at it and poof, it all goes away. And then I feel amazing. And then all the while it completely spiritually bypasses the existential crisis of the human condition that none of us can escape. Right. So I look at all the different areas of research. And so the mechanistics cool. We could talk about it all day. And, and my objective with that and the mental map and all that is to at least make the psycho-emotional journey in eudaimonic journey or hedonic easier, right? Because if, if we can just optimize your physiology, optimize your metabolism and microbiome and everything in between, just optimize your soul vehicle, that is your body, your meat suit. If we can just get that working really, really, really well, at least then your spirit, your mind, your psychology, it's going to make that journey, which we're all going to have to face at some point, more bearable. 
to some degree. And, and it's really helpful to distinguish of like, this is a symptom being driven by neuroinflammation, oxidative stress, HPA, blah, blah, blah. And let's not have that distort our existential vision or perception of self in, in the world around us. But even you, you look at like the psychological research of even, you know, meaning making in the face of adversity and trauma is actually part of what brings us fulfillment and happiness. This idea of we're all going to face adversity. We're all going to experience traumas, but finding and, and making meaning. What does it mean for us? And, and, and finding a sense of purpose in that, that's actually part of what we need to be happy. So what I battle through my platform is the content that performs well is the mechanistic root cause. And I think, I think the reason why is be because people don't want to do that inner work so much. That's scary. It's daunting. You know, what are they going to see within? If they look within, whatever. They, it's a lot easier, like just, okay, so Brennan, you're saying if I buy your mental map lab test, you can give me a protocol that makes all my problems go away. And it's like, well, no, but then if I put up a post that's like his victim and mentality or root cause, it doesn't perform, doesn't reach. That's not the message people want. That's the battle that I face. And even using myself as an example, you know, uh, I, you know, live about as healthy as a lifestyle as I think a man really could these days for the most part. You know, if you looked at my regimen, it's a masterpiece scientifically. And even still, like I still have my human struggles. Like I'm the mental health guy or whatever, but it's like, I still have my hard days, right? My, my mental health was tested pretty heavily in 2022. And, you know, while I'm medication free, like I still do therapy. I just started doing therapy again this past year. Cause I was like, I need to start back up and I have an amazing therapist. And I think there's no substitute for talk therapy. So something that I'm always encouraging people on, you know, I look at it as my place to educate and empower people, right? That's what I try to do of like, there's a time and a place for those neuropsychiatric drugs. There's a time and a place for tripping on ayahuasca in Costa Rica, if that's your jam. There's a time and a place uh, for talk therapy, but, you know, the lifting weights and the lifestyle. So that's kind of ultimately what I'm trying to do is I want to educate you know, enough on the mechanism and science that it gives people hope, like I can get better and giving them a deeper understanding of like, look, you can't escape the human condition, but we can optimize it. There's so much that we can do. Um, and I also try to bring a lot of objectivity to it because I think these days, you know, trends, right? Like even with the dietary trends of it's not just keto anymore, paleo, it's vegan and carnivore. It's more confusing than ever. So I'm really big on bringing some objectivity to it. And to wrap that up where, you know, you're asking about the, the predispositions of, and whatnot, where there's plenty of studies of like, okay, um, you know, veterans that had higher inflammatory markers that then went off to war and experienced trauma had more severe PTSD than the veterans that had lower inflammatory markers pre-trauma or different observational studies of, well, they experienced trauma and then they all had higher inflammatory markers, right? So that's what's really cool about it and why I've kind of used like the neuroinflammation, neuroplasticity angle because it's scientifically sound, it's mechanistically sound, but then you can kind of spin it in this other way because like with trauma, what you're, I think, alluding to a little bit is we have to change our belief systems to some degree to make it something that empowers us rather than breaks us. And that's hard to do. If you can manage to take the most traumatic thing that ever happened to you and turn it into one of the most meaningful things that ever happened to you, like I think I'm a testament of, that's really powerful. And so then to kind of put a cool sciencey spin on it where, well, to change your beliefs about something, you literally have to change your neural networks, the way that your brain is wired, which then means, you know, synaptic trimming and pruning, which is how we essentially disintegrate neural connections. And guess what? The microglial cells regulate that. And it takes a lot of neuroplasticity to then create new neural networks associated with new knowledge, new learning, memory, belief systems, behaviors. So a huge thing is like, ultimately, we need behavior modification, which requires belief modification, which requires neuroplastic remodeling. And so then from a metabolic illness with 88% of Americans being metabolically ill in a chronic inflammation crisis, well, neuroinflammation and neuroplasticity are antagonistic mechanisms. And we need homeostatic balance between those, those mechanisms. You know, acute neuroinflammation is good. It protects our brain, but chronic meta 
neuroinflammation. That's why Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death. So part of what I kind of try to angle it is like, hey, I can't find your sense of purpose for you. I can't change your belief system of your trauma for you, but I can help you objectively look under the hood, assess that neuroinflammatory burden, use holistic interventions to bring down that cytokine storm in your brain. So that way you can more readily change your neural networks, change your belief systems, look within, it stabilizes behavior and mood. So I like to take that holistic approach of we have to do that inner work psychoemotionally, but we also have to address the dysfunctional physiology. And when you have so many Americans that are physiologically dysregulated, dysfunctional, to me, that's the low hanging fruit. That's the easy part. You know, labs and protocols, easy. Finding your why, finding your purpose, you know, facing your traumas, doing the therapy, that's that's the hard part. So I look at as how can we make that a little bit easier? Yeah, dude, that's beautifully said. Let me um I want to go through in detail this, you know, sort of the major mechanism of neuroinflammation and these insults. Before I do, I, and before we leave this, because I think it's so important, is I just want to um, point out a couple things and make sure I heard you right. So, in, and make sure uh, the listener doesn't miss this. So, if we're listening to Brendan, there was a part there where he essentially walked us through this idea that if you change your beliefs, which is not necessarily an easy thing to do, which is why Brendan's saying, uh, you know, the, the sort of lower hanging fruit is dealing with some of the physiological stuff. But if we can change our belief, which is another way of saying changing our underlying stories that we tell in our subconscious, there is a way to do that. But if we can begin to change our belief about a trauma and he said it, you said it so beautifully, man, where it's essentially like the the one one way to start is to say, how does this trauma and by the way, all the exposure therapy, written exposure therapy, all the stuff regarding exposure therapy uh, as it pertains to trauma, including PTSD, essentially says if we can get people to make their trauma mean something positive, something they can learn from, grow from and help from, that is the step that helps them begin to move out of the victim state more into the hero state. And if we're listening to Brendan, that is also uh, very clearly something that seems to uh, be uh, beneficial for neuroplasticity, if I'm hearing you correctly, Brendan, that that is essentially rewiring the brain. And to rewire the brain, we need all these other mechanisms that disconnect neural connections and connect other connections. So you're literally changing the brain when we change our belief. And Brendan just gave us a really beautiful way to think about this, which is essentially stop thinking of your trauma and identifying with your trauma as the thing that harmed you. Start seeing your trauma and identifying with your trauma as the thing that has helped you and will help you to help others, which is very clearly what Brendan's story is. And so that in itself explains a very powerful shift in belief that we can all start now. And as a matter of fact, this is what I do, Brendan. I don't know if you know, but I, I run something called The Journey, which is essentially people come stay with me in my house for four days. And we essentially use written exposure therapy, micro dosing, along with fasting, walking and deep psychological principles and lectures to essentially change those underlying seed stories that people don't know exist regarding their trauma. And what you'll find is that whether we like it or not, we all have a victim story and we don't necessarily know how to tell the hero story. So Brendan is pushing us to this idea that the hero story is a pretty easy story. It just essentially says, take your worst trauma, figure out a way that it help, has helped you, taught you, and will help you help others. And that is the story of the hero. So what's really interesting about that is that that seems, if I'm hearing you correctly, seems to be one of the very first ways to decrease neuroinflammation and begin to increase neuroplasticity. Now, when we begin to put on some of the other physiological aspects, not only would it seem, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Brendan, not only would it seem to begin to make a difference in terms of decreasing neuroinflammation, but it starts to push us in this feed forward cycle now where even the physical things that we do, supplements, things like that, diet, will also start to uh, enhance that a little bit. And so what I want to know from you is do where am I getting that wrong? Is that accurate from your perspective? And secondly, 
uh, let's start getting into the actual mechanisms for other insults. Like what are the other things besides just trauma and adverse effects, events that trigger this neuroinflammation? Uh, things like I know you talk a lot about mold and, you know, sort of uh, uh, dysbiosis and the inflammatory signals coming from things like LPS and other things like that that can impact on this. But two questions there. First question is, one, would you say that's accurate in terms of traumas? And two, what are the mechanisms you can begin helping us understand on the physical side with the neuroinflammatory insults? Yeah, I think that's a, a perfect segue, and it, it is accurate. I always like to say thoughts become proteins, um, which you know is really just kind of speaking to our very thoughts being an input signal to our epigenetics that's then going to ultimately dictate what kind of proteins our, our body is really making, assuming we don't have like endoplasmic reticulum stress, which most people do. So, you know, it's just like a fun kind of sciencey way to connect, you know, the, the psycho emotional, spiritual to the very tangible biological, physiological. Um, you know, it's a weird thing. I, I'm one of those guys I like to keep my head in head on head in the clouds and feet on the ground, right? You know, it's like I like to go out there and explore but also stay kind of grounded in, in truth and objective reality to some degree. Um, and so, you know, I think it's really interesting with trauma and how we change our beliefs about something where, and that's why I love the neuroinflammatory neuroplastic aspect is, you know, it's like that documentary. And I mean, psychedelics is the perfect kind of subject that ties it all together because, you know, psychedelics are so popular because more so the spiritual experience you know how we those of us that have done psychedelics and it's like if you haven't done it you just you just don't know you don't know what you're missing really um in a lot of ways because that very spiritually profound experience that that psychedelics can help you tap into and elicit kind of unlike anything else really and that ego dissolution being able to see like your entire life more objectively kind of through this third eye open deep sense of understanding connected to the fabric of life itself that is just pure love and realizing all of your false narratives that you're in your own way that's that's kind of some of the verbiage i would use to try to describe what is kind of an indescribably magical experience on psychedelics so that's more the psycho-emotional sort of experience but then you look at well, what's going on cellularly neurologically physiologically and it's like well like psilocybin and LSD in particular, two of the more popular, they're both serotonin 5-HT2A agonists. They, they stimulate the serotonergic system, stimulates tyrosine kinase B, which then transcribes for BDNF, which is our main neurotrophin factor to help with facilitating neuroplasticity. So at more of a cellular level, mechanistically, like more of a pharmacological mechanism of action perspective, these psychedelics have that very promising effect of reducing that neuroinflammation, which is degenerating our brain and disrupting our neurotransmitters and making our behavior volatile and, and increasing symptoms of depression, anxiety, insomnia, brain fog, the list goes on and on. Um, so that's why it's like I'm all about then exploring like, hey, maybe I can't do that hero's journey for you. Maybe because I've had my own hero's journey, maybe I can help guide and motivational interview, drop some breadcrumbs, try to get you thinking, try to reflect some things back to you a little bit. And I do what I can, but something like I was saying that low hanging fruit is, well, gosh, a lot of these people have a laundry list of neuroinflammatory insults that contribute to this, what I like to call that neuroinflammatory load. So to your point, then segueing into some of those root cause factors, I mean, it's it's so many things. And even today on social, I posted kind of a summary because I call it microglial activation syndrome. It's the, the phrase that I coined. And it's just kind of this concept of, you know, when these microglial cells, which are just the innate white blood cell of your brain that really regulate neuroinflammation and neuroplasticity and synaptic trimming and pruning and neurodevelopment, neurodegeneration, they steal the show with all of it. So looking at like, well, what factors piss off the microglial cells? Because what I don't like, whether we're talking about mast cells or neutrophils or macrophages or micro, it doesn't matter. Sometimes people talk in, in the functional medicine space, they talk kind of in like, well, mast cell dysfunction or cellular dysfunction. And it's like the cells are not behaving dysfunctionally. 
they, they are doing what they evolved to do, which is respond to the milieu, to the environment. So then the question is, what kind of juices, if you will, are your microglial cells or any other immune cell floating around in? You know, so if it's like a hyperglycemic, you know, high free fatty acids and ceramides and oxidative molecules and pro-inflammatory molecules or, you know, pathogen associated toxins like mold and mycotoxins or the lipopolysaccharide, which that's kind of a cool clinical pearl too, that ties a lot of these elements together. Those lipopolysaccharide from the gram negative bacteria in your gut. And obviously if you have a leaky dysbiotic gut, you have more of this endotoxin burden and translocation. But a cool pearl is the main thing that scientists and researchers use to induce neuroinflammation in mostly rat models to study mental illness, neurodegeneration, neurodevelopmental issues. They use LPFs. You know, they'll take rats, inject them with lipopolysaccharide, and that is one of the most potent activators of the microglial cells into their cytotoxic neuroinflammatory M1 phenotype. So even with like neurodegeneration or whatever, it's like they'll take rats, inject them with the LPS to activate the neuroinflammation and decrease the neuroplasticity, but then give them like, well, what drug can we give them to then reverse that effect or treat that? Whereas obviously it's like, well, wait a second, as root cause providers, we're like, well, what if our clients and patients have increased endotoxin burden? They have more LPS floating around in their bloodstream and you know, crossing the blood-brain barrier and pissing off their microglial cells. So rather than giving a drug to fix the problem that the LPS started, which is so validated, that's the primary neuroinflammation research model, you know, so that opens up that whole gut health, microbiome, leaky gut, dysbiotic gut, like as one major root cause hub. So I find myself preaching a lot about mindset, metabolism, and microbiome. I'm very much of the mindset and Believe you me, I mean, I have a little curriculum where we go into all the things, metals and stealth infections and glyphosate and all these other, you know, kind of root cause factors that could be contributing. But to me, the three big rocks that matter more than anything else, mindset, metabolism, microbiome, you know, and when you look at whether it's the microbiome angle and the dysbiotic leaky gut and sort of the existential or extinction crisis of the microbiological world, you know, in modern society that aspect, the metabolic crisis that you and I are obviously very astute to, and the importance of weightlifting and sunshine and sleep and, you know, nutrient dense food, and then the mindset that we've talked about so far. So to me, I'm kind of constantly preaching of these three interfaces are what matters most if we really want a healthy psychoneuroendocrine immunological complex, right? Because that's the thing, while sure, like I love talking about microglial cells all day, and I, that's my main, you know, lecture and thing for functional medicine practitioners. But my message to the world is so much more broad, right? You know, it's changing those input signals that your cells, your tissue, your genetics are receiving. So, you know, there's so many different root cause factors that can be explored. And all these people that, you know, come to my practice or anybody else, they all have a laundry list of psychological healing opportunities and those root cause physiological. So, and all too often, I, I find clients and patients, consumers, self healers, whatever we want to call them, they kind of go down one path or the other. Some people get really into, you know, self help and psycho emotional. Some people lose themselves down the psychedelic rabbit hole. Other people burning thousands and thousands on functional lab testing and root cause protocols. But the magic happens when we combine all of the above. And, and then, of course, I like to kind of track all this objectively quantifying their symptomatology and their biomarkers so we can really see like, well, you can do whatever intervention resonates with you, but is it working? Is it moving the needle? Is your perceived quality of life improve, improving? Are your symptoms going down and are your biomarkers stabilizing? If I can prove those three things, I think my work here is kind of done. It's time for one of our sponsors, and this sponsor is a very exciting one and a new one, Timeline Nutrition and their supplement, MitoPure. Now, if I was going to ask you what is the most important aspect of metabolism, the mitochondria would have to be tops on your list. The mitochondria are the little energy producing factories inside every single one of your cells. They take the end products of the food we eat, they break them down into cellular ATP and provide energy for the entire metabolism. And these mitochondria 
if they are healthy and acting appropriately, can keep us looking good, feeling good, living longer, and functioning better. However, when they are not at optimal function, when they are burning energy in a dirty fashion, when they are damaged, they actually speed cellular aging. They speed up the aging process. We end up suffering from things like fatigue. We end up having all manner of dysfunctions, including weight loss resistance and other issues around weight loss. The mitochondria are the most important elements for the metabolism to function optimally, lose weight, age appropriately, et cetera. In this compound, MitoPure, that Timeline Nutrition has developed, there is a product called Urolithin A. Now, Urolithin A is an interesting compound because it is a postbiotic. Now, what does that mean? A postbiotic is a compound that is made from the bacteria in the gut. And so when you eat things like pomegranates, strawberries, walnuts, things with polyphenols like this, they go into the digestive tract, your gut bacteria start working on them and they can create compounds. Urolithin A is one compound that is in the MitoPure product. It comes from, naturally occurs in nature from this bacteria in our gut that break down the polyphenols from primarily foods like pomegranates, strawberries, etc. And it can increase mitophagy in mitochondria. So you might say, well, Jade, what is mitophagy? Mitophagy is the ability for mitochondria to repair and regenerate and recycle their proteins and to stay healthy and functional and de-age. When we can stimulate mitophagy, we can keep our mitochondria functioning efficiently. We can decrease aging. We can increase energy. We can improve our ability to lose weight, function optimally, and stave off diseases of aging. This is what Timeline Nutrition has done with their MitoPure product and the urolithin A that is in it. This is a very exciting area of research. We have not had the ability to support the mitochondria in the way that we do now with this particular product. You definitely are going to want to check this out. I've been taking the product for several months now. It is one of these products that I really, really strongly recommend. To get the product MitoPure, all you have to do to, is go to TimelineNutrition.com backslash next level. TimelineNutrition.com backslash next level. And let's get back to the show. Yeah. Yeah, I want to I wanna just uh, bring, because I, I think you know this, Brandon, but there's a lot, a lot of practitioners who listen to this podcast. So I have a lot of lay listeners, and I would say it's easily 50-50. But one of the things for the, the lay public, those of you who aren't practitioners, one of the things that uh, that Brennan just gave us, which is a powerful clinical pearl. Remember, he was talking about the mice and injecting this LPS. Um, we have a source of LPS, one source of LPS for us humans. It's coming uh, from the gut, as Brendan said. And so this is why people like Brennan and I focus so much on uh, the microbiome and sort of gut health. And it's so important to Brennan, if you're listening to him, that it's one of his big three rocks, his big three pillars, that he knows if he uh, gets this right, he can undo a lot of this insult. So you can think of this gut endotox, and that's what we call it, LPS, that is released from the gut into the digestive system, or into the blood, the bloodstream, rather, irritating the brain, so to speak. And one, I want to give uh, just an analogy or a metaphor, and, and maybe I'm going to get this wrong, Brennan. So if I get it wrong, just uh, correct me. But one of the things I like to think about the microglial cells is I think about it as, you know, you know, the immune system of the brain in a sense. And I like to think of them as essentially gardeners who are essentially pruning hedges, weed in the garden, uh, you know, bringing in soil and, you know, essentially keeping the garden uh, beautiful. And Brennan alluded to this, but as the different inputs come in, these gardeners can only work with uh, what they're given in a sense, right? So like if they're not the ones purchasing the soil necessarily, they're not the ones necessarily uh, purchasing the plants, but they are the ones trying to take care of it in a sense. So if you're bringing in um, shitty plants, uh, you know, uh, depleted soil uh, through your lifestyle, these microglial cells, as Brennan alluded to, are simply going to react to that. They're going to do the best they can with what they have. And so 
one of the things that we want to be aware of is if we see this as essentially uh, and, and Brendan may or may not like this metaphor. We'll see what he thinks about this. But one of the things we could think if we could think of these as gardeners in the brain and you supplying them with the best soil, the most beautiful plants and things like that to help them do their job. And then think of your mindset and things like that as the weather conditions. And if you're always sort of in this victim mentality and this and that, well, then the microglial cells can't come out. They're not going to be in the garden because, you know, it's raining and storming and lightning all the time and the weather's just too bad, perhaps so bad that it's doing damage. That would be essentially uh, your mindset. And of course, this LPS and stuff like that is uh, sort of the soil. And so this particular metaphor for brain irritation. Um, I want to see what you think about that, Brendan. Would you say, yes, Jade, I think that's pretty accurate. Are there other aspects of the microglial cells we should be aware of that uh, maybe it's too simplistic to call them gardeners in, in this sense? But just for the listener to sort of understand this, would you say this would be a good model? And is there anything, if so, uh, is there anything uh, that you would correct about that or any things that you would add in terms of how to think about this? Yeah, no, uh, I love that analogy. And it was cool to hear it. Um, because I think if, if we combine mine with yours, it, it's pretty magical because the gardener analogy is amazing because with like neuroinflammation and neuroplasticity, the analogy I usually use is like, you think about, um, you know, farmers when they burn their field where the point it's a, a acute controlled strategic temporary burn for the sake of clearing the land, recycling elements back to the soil so that new crops, new life can grow, right? That's like acute inflammation or acute neuroinflammation, you know, within the brain, which is a good thing. It's helpful as opposed to that chronic inflammation or chronic neuroinflammation being that forest fire that's, you know, gotten out of control. Whereas like neuroplasticity and neurogenesis, birth of new neurons and changing the way that they're wired, you know, I picture like the rainforest, or I guess we could use the farm field or the garden of all the vegetation that's growing and flourishing, the neurites that they're reaching out with their branches and everything. Um, so that's kind of one analogy that I like to use for the neuroinflammation, neuroplasticity side of it. But with the microglial cells, I've always described it the way I like to teach it is like uh, they're the guardians and the architects of the central nerve system. And the garden analogy works perfectly. I've always described it where you know, with a any kind of immune cell, but in this case, the microglial cells, when they're sort of inactive, they're what we call quiescent, which isn't really inactive. I use the analogy of that's like a police officer that's just doing his patrol. He's just driving around the city. He's just cruising. He's chill. Nothing going on. He's just doing his rounds. So that's like your quiescent microglial cell patrolling the brain. But then obviously, if that cop gets like a radio signal of like, hey, there's a bad guy that you need to go like shoot or arrest, what's he going to do? He's going to flip on his lights, go G.I. Joe mode, where he's, you know, flying down the highway, sirens and lights blazing, whipping out his gun, firing off rounds. You know, it's it's a battlefield potentially. So that's what happens when a microglial cell gets activated into its M1 phenotype. It's this pro-inflammatory neuro destructive potentially now you know he's going after a bad guy but you know sometimes bullets are flying there's collateral damage oops i shot a neuron now that neuron is popping open guts are flying whatever it could get messy versus like let's say the cop gets a radio signal that's like hey there's a sweet old lady that needs a little help or something so that's what i call the m2 phenotype it's it's cyto it's cellular protective it's neuroprotective neuroregenerative and we have to keep in mind, because everybody always asks me of like, well, so how do I know if they're like M1 polarized? And then how do I switch it to M2? And it's like, hey, 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 we are talking about cells that are extremely dynamic. In fact, some of the emerging research where they're looking at surface protein expression to dictate is this microglial cell and it's M1 neuroinflammatory phenotype or, you know, M2 anti-inflammatory phenotype. And it's like, actually, it seems like it can kind of do both, like at the same time. Right. I almost picture like a welder where it's like use the fire to soften the metal, use the water to, to solidify it. You know, it's molding, it's molding the fabric of our central nerve system, changing the way the neurons are connected and everything. So it's kind of that fire and ice of use the pro inflammatory mechanisms to burn up the pathogen or remodel the tissues and using the neurotrophic factors. That's that's the cooling water to solidify this new neural network. 
And so, you know, then you look at how the input signals from the environment, from the milieu, are going to influence the morphology of that microglial cell. And it's this spectrum. So I have a graphic that I, you know, it's on my social and everything, but a graphic that illustrates this. And so essentially it's this spectrum. And we have to be thinking about all of our microglial cells. Are they spending too much time in that pro-inflammatory phenotype? And the answer for Americans is a resounding yes. Under normal physiological conditions, that system is homeostatic. It's in balance. It's in harmony as it should be. But you start looking at the standard American metabolism and the standard American gut. You know, we have the hypertension, the dyslipidemia, the hyperinsulinemia, the homocystinuria, um, excess body fat. And, and there's so many side conversations we could have. And that's what gets me excited. Because even like, you know, putting that we know hyperglycemia is damaging to the brain and the microglial cells. You know, now some people are starting to chirp about Alzheimer's as a type three diabetes because the neurons are becoming insulin resistant, um, which is, is true, but there's other factors with that. So like the high blood sugar, high lipids, high body fat, we know body fat's very pro-inflammatory, a lot of interleukin six secretion, which stimulates CRP and causes leaky brain and activates the microglial cells in the brain. So this is a cool pearl that rather than going on and on and on in all these directions, but to finish the analogy and, and a cool spin on it, even just at like a metabolic interface perspective, just good old fashioned nutrition and fitness, or even body composition, right? We know that the extra adipose will drive more pro-inflammatory cytokines that can activate the glial system of the brain and cause this neuroinflammatory phenotype. But then where a skeletal muscle actually releases BDNF, that brain derived neurotrophic factor, that's like our main, you know, quenching neuroprotective molecule. So it's secondary name originally when the scientists first found it, they're like, well, it's brain derived. So it's brain derived neurotrophic factor. But then some years later, they realized, wait, our, our skeletal muscle also produces this. It's also a myokine. So you think about even what would happen with 70% of Americans being overweight or obese. Even if we just focused on a more superficial conversation of decreasing the body fat that's promoting that neuroinflammatory phenotype and increasing lean mass, and that's going to result in more neurotrophic activity. So it's like that's the mechanistic explanation for why we've been telling geriatric patients with Alzheimer's to exercise and do puzzles and do physical therapy. It slows down the neurodegenerative process. Why? That's the mechanism. Now we just understand the mechanism, but we've known this for a long time, right? So I think it's a very empowering conversation. But yeah, I love the gardener analogy. That was perfect. Uh, the cop analogy. So I, I think that makes, um, you know, neuroimmunology maybe a little bit more understandable and relatable. Yeah, I'm going to give one more uh, one more metaphor analogy. Then I want to go into really just picking your brain about some key uh, things that we can actually do. So one of the things that um, just reminded me as Brendan was talking is one of the analogies I like to use for the metabolism is like a dual head satellite, right? It's a sensing and responding apparatus. So one, one satellite dish is focusing outside and looking at the environment and looking for essentially stress to respond to. Um, and there's another satellite head focusing in the body. And it's essentially looking at what the cell's uh, signals are sending. So, you know, Brendan alluded to this idea that the fat cells, the adipokines are sending one, one signal, the muscle cells, the myokines are sending another signal, the immune system, the cytokines. And by the way, there's a lot of overlap between these uh, signaling molecules are sending another type of signal. The brain is essentially picking all these signals up and also picking up the signals from the outside world, you know, temperature, uh, light, food availability, emotional stress, beliefs, all these things and integrating them. And if you're listening to Brennan, one of the things that uh, we're essentially talking about here is that a lot of these insults, uh, whether it be LPS from the gut, whether it be mycotoxins uh, from molds and things like that, whether it be an, inflammatory, uh, an infection from a virus, whether it be any kind of other inflammatory mechanism from belief or whatever, is essentially, for lack of a better term, uh, irritating and disrupting the ability of this satellite to sense and respond and integrate the two signals of what the body needs versus what the body's um, essentially dealing with. And I think this is where I really like what you said, Brendan, about <clears throat> your sort of three big rocks. 
versus focusing on all the the other things that are important and may be more important depending on how, who the patient we're talking to is. But these three big rocks of sort of microbiome, sort of metabolism, which I know muscle and that aspect is a big aspect of that for you and mindset uh, as well. These are the three big ones. And then there's these, uh, these other little ones there. So that's one way that I would say we should be looking at metabolism. And now I want to ask you, and maybe I'll just throw some things out for you since we're sort of clear now and sort of where are some of these insults coming from inside and outside the body. So as this satellite is looking and seeing, let's say, um, compounds coming from the gut, uh, primarily, let's say we've talked about LPS, there's others, but what would be the major uh, thing that you would uh, do to deal with that? I know that, you know, you're someone who likes a very particular type of probiotic, myself as well. Probiotics are all over the place. Not all of them do the thing, but there are some that have been shown to decrease this LPS. Uh, I, I wonder, I know that I've seen you recommend one uh, that I use also in the past. I want to see if you still do, but give me a little bit of feedback on what you would do there. Is it as simple as taking probiotics? Is it a particular type of probiotic? Is it you know, decreasing carbohydrates because they feed these gram negative bacteria? Is it decreasing fat because gram negative, this LPS hitches rides on fat to get inside us? What would you say the three things? I know we could, you know, go forever on this particular topic. It's a whole other three podcasts. But if you were going to say, okay, everyone, if you want to deal with some of the insults that are coming to the, the brain uh, immune system from the gut, what would be your primary one, two or three interventions there? Yeah, you know, what's really cool about um, a big part of my strategy, I'm, I'm very transparent about all this, is it's like, I mean, most most peer-reviewed literature is pharmaceutical funded in general, and, and there's so much amazing information we can extrapolate from the pharmaceutical research and science. So in some ways, a lot of like what I do is I'm looking at what big pharma is having success with at a synthetic pharmacological agent that has this specific mechanism of action, or maybe it's kind of misunderstood to some degree. And then I reverse engineer it of like, okay, well, what can we do holistically to modulate the same mechanisms? And, you know, maybe it's not going to be quite as like potent as that cyclooxygenase inhibitor or the uh, monoclonal antibodies, which are a big thing they're starting to try to employ for mental illness so much. So there is um, an interleukin-6 monoclonal antibody, so designer antibody. You know, we heard a lot about monoclonal antibodies through COVID. <clears throat> and they have this uh, drug through phase two clinical trials for treatment-resistant depression, right? So you have somebody that's depressed. They've already tried frontline treatment of SSRIs, 30% efficacy, not great. They didn't respond well to treatment. So then the idea would be second-line treatment of this designer antibody that works by binding and blocking pro-inflammatory cytokines. The idea being, let's prevent those pro-inflammatory messengers from then activating that neuroinflammatory storm in the brain that then causes the depression, anxiety, blah, 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 blah. So I always like to kind of compartmentalize. I, I created this functional intervention spectrum for the sake of my institute and training providers because it can get very overwhelming very quickly. You got people worried about EMF or gluten or glyphosate or the, the mold in their windowsill. But then what about that trauma I haven't resolved? And then what about my diet and how do I work out? All these things. So I like to, you know, with this functional intervention spectrum, be looking at, well, we've always got the pill for the ill with pharm pharmacological side. That's great. There's time and place. But the psychoemotional intervention, the uh, environmental aspects, the lifestyle, and then supplemental, you know, those are my domains. Those are the areas I focus. And, you know, sure, of course, popping pills, it's what we're all conditioned to do and reach for. And yeah, you know, the probiotics and the zinc, you know, the omega-3s and folate and B vitamins and magnesium. And, you know, there's many nutraceuticals and botanicals and probiotics that can be very, very powerful for modulating these mechanisms uh, at a relatively potent degree, right? And whereas that synthetic Band-Aid, it's not really fixing the root of the problem. Some of these supplements can address some of those roots of the problem, but as you and I can appreciate, and probably all of your listeners, like you can't supplement your way out of a toxic environment or, or, or a self-destructive, you know, lifestyle. Right. So that always brings me back full circle of like, well, we have to get the mindset and whatever it takes, psychotherapy or psychedelics and whatever it is, whatever it takes. 
But then that environmental side of, you know, the the mold, you're in a water damaged home and you're breathing in mycotoxins and the LPS from the environment as well. And you're huffing all that in or, you know, you think about the train derailment in Ohio and what's that spitting into the air, the EMF and the glyphosate. So I'm huge on the environmental side of things. And of course, the lifestyle medicine, which is, you know, our bread and butter with the, the nutrition, the, the fitness, the sunlight exposure. You mentioned earlier, too, I, I loved that you did of how the brain is integrating all these input signals from all the above, which is so perfect, because even like there are some things outside our control that might make us feel depressed for a day or two of like you think about allergies and the seasonal allergy and boom, you're histaminergic. So you're feeling depressed and antidonic and brain fog for a few days or like barometric pressure. I don't know about you, but like when the barometric, when the pressure drops, I'll, I'll get depressed. And there's even studies that show that of like something that's totally outside of our control of the pressure of the atmosphere itself can then have that impact on, on our body and make us feel depressed. Or I'm personally very sensitive to uh, sunlight. Like I crave sunlight more than I crave food or sleep. This is a light therapy box that's lighting me up right now. So I, I like to, I'm glad that we're taking the time to kind of expand this conversation because what I never want to do, because I think there's too many functional medicine people doing this, is pulling people down these rabbit holes of just this one thing. I get inquiries all the time from wannabe clients that are like, well, I'm working with two functional medicine doctors. This one says it must be mold. This one says it must be parasites. What do you think? And I'm like, well, one, hire me before you're going to get my professional opinion and maybe get some cooks out of the kitchen. There's too many cooks in the kitchen. But also like, you know, what basis do they have to stand on? So this is why I also am huge on the objectivity, right? Because people are going to latch on to whatever ideas resonate with them. And a lot of times they're, they're spiritually bypassing the work that they know they need to do. They know they need to eat better. They know they should start moving more. They know they should get out in the sunlight more. They know that. They know that they probably should go to psychotherapy. But what do they do instead? A parasite protocol because somebody pushed on their arm and said they have stealth infection somewhere. And I just, I can't stand that stuff. So that's why I'm huge on tracking the data of like, let's get some solid biomarkers that we can track objectively. Let's track your symptoms, your perceived quality of life. And then let's begin that mindful journey where we're transforming your mindset, transforming your microbiome, your lifestyle, your environment, supplementation. The whole mantra of my business is prevention is the greatest treatment and the greatest medicine will teach people how not to need it. You know, but at least I'm doing it in what I think is a more evidence-based, objective, data-driven way, because otherwise people start just losing themselves down all these things. And, you know, that sensation of, well, if I just consume all the free Instagram content and integrate none of it, at least I tried and I did something, right? So it's a complex journey, which is why I'm so glad we started with you depicting the hero's journey. So that brings it all in, in a foot. Now imagine if that hero along the hero's journey, well, if he's metabolically ill and compromised, you know, okay, well, that's a huge opportunity that the hero can do to optimize his, his more altruistic journey. So there's a lot of components to it. But I think through this conversation, we've created actually a pretty good like model and roadmap that then people can kind of start seeing how it all relates back and then picking like, where do I begin? You know, where, where with the work do I begin? Yeah, 100%. And what I want to do to wrap it up is let's just take your uh, sort of your three, uh, you know, sort of models, uh, mindset, uh, metabolism, microbiome. Those are the three, right? Yeah. Your biggest ones. Yeah. You know, ultimately, uh, I feel like those are the three areas that I'm kind of, we need to be actively working in, in all three areas constantly. Because a lot of the other details, you know, are, are going to follow through with that and fall into one of those buckets, right? Because sure, we could talk about, well, what about like COVID and viruses, right? And it's like, well, yeah, you know, that can absolutely trigger the neuroinflammatory storm. But it's like, okay, but I mean, we learned a lot through COVID of like optimizing the metabolic functionality and metabolic health, optimizing the microbiome is going to improve your immune system and make you more resilient to that stuff. So with the, you know, psycho-emotional side, that one, I, I don't, that's a harder one for me to advise on because I think that's such a journey that's so bio-individualized. You know, some people it's going to be Reiki. Some people it's going to be yoga. I am a big yogi. Uh, I love walking in nature. I do psychotherapy, like whatever it takes. And, and 
I do like the psychedelic conversation that falls into that bucket just as much as any other bucket with changing the belief system in, in general, making, you know, instead of a self-limiting narrative, you know, a self-empowering narrative. So that's the the bucket there, you know, metabolism, man, you know, it's cool seeing like, when did weight training get so trendy? You know, <laughs> like we've been doing it forever. And now all of a sudden it's like, what cracks me up, Jay, because you're one of those, like, you're, you're one of those muscle doctors. You're one of those few, like there's very few of you on, on this planet. We need more of you. But it is funny seeing some of these more like traditional doctors and now they're starting to catch on of like, oh, this fitness thing and this weightlifting thing, huh? So they're getting on board with that. The white coats are starting to, you know, pick up a barbell once in a while. But, you know, I, I argue all the time. I think at least 80% of the problems that we see in functional medicine every day, at least 80% of that could be fixed with, you know, a good, well, you know, prescribed functional fitness regimen nutritional coaching regimen and journey, sleep, sunlight, stress management, you know, lifestyle, at least 80%, right? And then of 100%. course, with that microbiome, you know, I, I could talk about the gut brain axis for hours, but I just, you know, simply will say, well, that the, the probiotic, I'll end on that clinical pearl because it's like, I can't say enough about the microbiome. And there's actually a lot of really beautiful esoteric postulates and truths and rhetorics that come with that you know i look at it as uh, this is more philosophical but i think humans were kind of dysbiotic organism on this planet like we're the only species on this planet that doesn't live in symbiotic harmony with the natural world so it's like not i'm not cynical i'm not nihilist you know i'm not humans are beautiful to some degree but like we're kind of the dysbiotic organism and at a greater collective level, I don't think we're going to reach, you know, eudaimonic utopia or whatever until we reachieve symbiosis. We had it back in hunter gatherer days, not anymore. We broke out of that natural biological law and world. Um, so there's that. And the microbiome is what kind of brings us to that truth because we need to get back to the soil, get back to the building blocks of life itself, which are microbes. And so that's what gets me really jazzed about the microbiome conversation. And so, you know, like with Megaspore as the go-to spore biotic and everything, um, as just one example where with those microglial cells, clinical pearl to wrap it up, we talked so much about the LPS from a dysbiotic leaky gut are the most like potent stimulators of neuroinflammation. And there are strong research papers that argue this is kind of like the root cause of root causes. Like this might be one of the leading causes of non-communicable diseases and inflammatory disease, this mechanism. And it's, it's more than the endotoxemia, but that's kind of the main mechanism, those LPS. And that's where, if you look at like a healthy microbiome that is diverse and produces a lot of short chain fatty acids, like butyrate in particular, but and I have a great graphic that illustrates this, but like LPS, one of the most pro neuroinflammatory substances in existence so much so they use it for research yeah. short chain fatty acids like butyrate have the exact opposite effect so if you took a microglial cell like an in vitro bv2 line of microglial cells you give them lps <laughs> neuroinflammation you know brain on fire mental illness neurodegeneration you give them butyrate that's what actually matures them matures them and helps with neurodevelopment in general, but also turns them into the M2 phenotype. So whereas the, the LPS drives them to that M1 pro-inflammatory, short-chain fatty acids drive them to the M2 phenotype. So that mechanistically right there kind of encapsulates the power of the microbiome and microbiology in shaping our metabolism and shaping our neural networks, thus shaping our mindset. So I love kind of how we're wrapping it all together with mindset, metabolism, microbiome, and all these plethora of healing opportunities within those buckets. Yeah, man, that was that was really perfectly, perfectly said sort of to wrap up. And I'll just give mine real quick in terms of the mindset. I'm, I'm very similar to Brendan. Lots of the same kinds of things. Lots of, you know, walking in nature, lots of relaxation. Very much a fan of psychedelics like you, Brendan. Um, uh, very much. Uh, I'm actually going back, I don't know if I told you, I'm going back to get my PhD in transpersonal psychology and getting a psychedelic certificate through my naturopathic um, degree because I want to study that. 
But there's a lot to be said there in terms of the metabolism. You know, for me, same with you. It's a, a lot of weight training, um, really just cutting out junk food. It, you know, if, if most Americans would just, you know, watch their blood sugar levels, start, uh, you know, sort of weight training more, it's going to be more powerful than any real supplements they can take. And then in terms of uh, sort of the microbiome, the same things we do to help metabolism are going to help the microbiome. Less junk food means less, you know, uh, less of this uh, fat and sugar sort of combination, which I see as a big issue in dysbiosis. And then, yes, targeted, evidence-based um, things that can decrease endotoxin like megaspore biotic, uh, probiotic. Um, those are sort of my big ones as well. So we find that we, you and I overlap a lot in those areas, which is not surprising. So to wrap up, I, I know, so just so all of you listening know, Brendan uh, has, because as you can tell, he's got a, a wealth of knowledge and he does a ton of education. So for you providers, Brendan, tell, tell the providers uh, where they can get your education and uh, do some of your certifications and things like that. Yeah. You know, I really appreciate the opportunity, brother, because that, I tell you what, that has become, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's my full time. That's my life. Building this thing is, is insane. And your purpose, man. It's like, you, you know, you took it yeah. from your experience. Yeah. You know, it, the, the FMHB functional mental health practitioner certificate program, it, it is, I could have never imagined this. I mean, I think it's been a long time coming. Um, and it was such an organic, I never intended on doing like any of this. It just organically evolved. So the FMHP certificate program, it just got to the point where it became very clear to me that we just need a new credential, a new breed of mental health professional. And so obviously I'm really nestled in the functional medicine and holistic health, you know, market. And, and one of my strategies, I did, I'm not trying to create you know, another like generic entry level holistic health kind of thing. I wanted this to be very, very specialized. And the whole curriculum is really built on the backbone of the subjects that we've covered pretty extensively today. It's all about the neuroinflammation, neuroplasticity, microglial model. And then we have, you know, units for every topic we've talked about. There's an entire psychedelic module, an entire gut brain access module, which is what I'm recording right now. And it's actually a three level program, too, which is a new announcement. This first time I'm announcing it publicly where the curriculum is getting so big that we're like, well, this needs to be a tiered thing. Level one, level two, level three. But um, we do a, you know, biannual enrollment. So right now we just have a, a wait list for our class three. But it's it's been uh, the greatest undertaking of my career, but also just the greatest privilege. I love doing this. I love building it. And there's nothing more medicinal and healing than, yeah, when you do that hero's journey and you take that pain, turn it into, into a purpose. And I'll share this and then I'll be quiet where, you know, one of my greatest passions um, has now transformed into, I started a uh, not-for-profit research foundation. And this is like brand new where I don't have the infrastructure built yet, but I do have the IRS letters. So it's a 501c3. And what we're going to be doing is uh, public facing educational workshops and events and using the funds that we raise to then fund our clinical research where we're working with people in need, research clients and using my mental map test. So essentially we're coll collecting their data while serving them. The idea being help those people in need, you know, reclaim their mental and metabolic health while collecting enormous amounts of data through machine learning algorithms. So that way we can advance the clinical research because, you know, as we all know, and big farm is not funding lifestyle intervention or supplemental intervention. So uh, I'm, that's the work that I, I'm in between FMHP and, and the foundation. Like that's where I'm going and I'm all in at this point. So it's such a pleasure to have the opportunity to share this with somebody that, you know, I've looked up to for years and has influenced my career and get to share it with your audience as well. Yeah, I'm super excited about that, Brandon. That is amazing. And then speaks to the hero's journey continuing. Uh, as we wrap it up, uh, why don't you give everybody sort of your website, social handles, uh, just so you guys know, Brandon is one of these people who gives a lot on social media, like a lot, a lot. And so um, definitely check him out there. Where can where can people find you, Brandon? And, and give them the give them where is it your website where they can go and purchase your courses and information? Yeah, thanks, brother. Uh, yeah, Instagram is the main platform that's at the Holistic Savage. And um, I, I 
try to put out a lot of good stuff on there. So I, I appreciate your uh, perception and acknowledgement there. And, you know, that link tree, the link in the profile bio, literally everything that I have to offer the world can be found through that link tree, whether it's the FMHP program or the mental map. The website is metabolicsolutionsllc.com. So that's another gateway. But these days, it seems to all be, you know, about the, the social and the link tree and everything. But yeah, I'm what is, what is your Instagram? Find. I'm just going to grab it real quick and let them know. What is it? Yeah, it's The Holistic Savage. Yeah, so at The Holistic Savage with uh, so it's the underscore holistic underscore savage. You guys will find Brendan uh, there as well. So any final any final things you want to leave us with, Brendan? So appreciate you, man. I mean, you're just a brilliant dude and just such a great heart and really appreciate you being on. You know, I mean, I, I feel that way and reciprocate that sentiment in whole. And, and I genuinely hope your audience receives all this well. I, I imagine they will. I can't wait to share this episode with my audience. But honestly, just on a personal level, like this was so rewarding and fulfilling for me. And I don't know when it's going to happen, but I know the day will come. We'll find a reason to hang out in person. You know, Angela was trying to get us at that same show last year and we'll we'll figure something out. Maybe we hang out in Sedona or, or do whatever. But it yeah, we need to we definitely pleasure. need to solidify our bro man. man. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. We haven't been able to meet in person. I've yeah. been looking forward to it for sure. So well, oh let's God. try to make that happen. Where are you, by the way? Uh, I'm where, in Kansas where, where City of all places. I'm Kansas right, City. Okay. right in the middle of the country here. Yeah. I've driven through there many times and, you know, cause you know, I love to drive across country all the time. <laughs> Sounds about right. Well, I, maybe I'll come to you then. You're always living in cooler places. Yeah, man. I mean, well, you know, Asheville, North Carolina is where I am now. I think people know that. And then Santa Monica. So I typically go uh, back and forth, but we'll hook up. Brendan, I cool. appreciate you, man. Hang on the line. I'm going to go ahead and shut down the recording. Just hang tight real quick. So Sounds we can good. make sure everything loads up. And everybody, thank you so much for checking out the show uh, today and make sure you check out Brendan. Appreciate you, and we'll see you at the next show. You have been listening to the Next Level Human podcast with Dr. Jade Tita. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure you subscribe and consider leaving a review. You make the biggest difference when you pass on your lessons and inspire others. That's why reviews like this are so powerful. Your words may be the only ones that resonate for someone else. Please remember the information in this podcast is for educational purposes only. Always consult your personal physician or therapist before making any lifestyle changes. And finally, thank you for who you are in the world and the difference you make. You make.